Who wants who wants to see my Kurt Angle smile? Anyway, yeah, sorry about that, don't know what came over me. My name is Adam Cleary, welcome back to What Culture Wrestling, and it is now time for the video. What video, you ask, because for some reason you closed your eyes when you clicked on it. Well, Kurt Angle, my pal, and yours is on the Stone Cold Sessions last night, and boy howdy, did he have some things to say. I mean, admittedly, that is the entire point of these shows. Stone Cold Steve Austin gets a guest on the Broken Skull Sessions, and he goes through their career, their, their story, their history, their time in the company, their time outside of the company and brings up all manner of revelations that only Stone Cold Steve Austin can really coax out of some people. Doesn't matter how many talks they go on, how many autobiographies they write, there's just something different about these shows. They're just so much more at ease talking to Austin than they are talking to themselves? Anyway, yes, Kurt Angle has now been added to the litany of stars Austin has had on his show, and it did not disappoint. In fact, I'd probably go so far as to say it was one of the most interesting guests he's had on there. Bear in mind how good the Undertaker episode was. That is high praise indeed. Now, am I just saying that because they got the cowboy hats out at the end and did all McDonald's? Yes. Yes, I am. Anyway, that slice of magic to one side, there were still revelations a go-go on this episode, and when we learn things here at What Culture Wrestling, we like to impart them onto you as well. So, my name is Adam Cleary, and these are 10 things we learned from Kurt Angle on Stone Cold Broken Skull Sessions. Number 10, his first WWE contract was for $50,000. Now you might have heard the story about when Kurt Angle was first approached about joining the WWF after his Olympic gold success. He laughed at it because he didn't want to get into all that fake stuff. Well, according to this episode, he was offered half a million dollars a year, which was a huge contract at the time, to make the jump to pro wrestling. And yeah, he knocked it back. He had no interest in it whatsoever. And it wasn't until two years later when he was looking for a new challenge, he thought, maybe actually I should give that a go. So he went back to Vince McMahon for another bite at his proverbial cherry, but was told that now, son, things were different. So different, in fact, that they offered him one tenth of the original contract, a measly 50 thousand dollars to join the company until he could prove that he could hang in this industry and could make his way naturally up the ladder. Now Angle, far from being insulted at this absolute pittance he was being offered, thought, do you know what? That represents a challenge to me. They're not going to give me the big bucks until I prove I can do it. And do you know what? I believe I can do it. So he took that contract and decided to make it work. Even more funny than that, though, was the fact that he actually asked for the same kind of money Austin was on a few years later and was pretty much laughed out of the room. He did say he did get considered to be more than the 50 grand, but he did not get what Steve Austin was getting. Number nine, Angle's original character was Reverse Rock. All right, so this is quite a good one. Vince McMahon sat down with Kurt Angle not long after he accepted that contract and laid out his vision for Angle's character. They were going to use all the things that made him a popular Olympian, and that would get him over with the wrestling audience. Intensity, integrity, intelligence, they were going to become his new catchphrase thingy. And the uh, confusion arises because Angle was like, are you sure? Are you sure that's going to make people like me, Vince? And Vince went, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what getting over means. Getting over means your character clicks with the audience. We're going to make you incredibly unlikable. Angle still didn't really get it. And he actually pointed at his opening vignettes and went, yeah, but they're not. They're really uncool. I'm going to look like a dork. I'm going to look like some kind of goody two-shoes. And Vince just probably sat there and went, yes. Yes, you are. Now, while it is easy to make fun of Vince McMahon for being just a horny million-year-old haunted tree these days, he was a genius back then, and he told Angle specifically to celebrate like he had just won the Olympics after every win. Didn't matter if he cheated or he beat the Brooklyn Brawler or somebody like that. This was the biggest thing in the world, and if you recall, that got Angle heat immediately. Number eight, WWE told him he couldn't make serious merch money. Now, Angle might have accepted that 50 grand contract, but he still wasn't an idiot. He realized that the way to make the mega bucks in this company was through merchandise. Like, Austin's 316 top had been just the biggest thing in the world for a while. The Rock was coming up with a new printable catchphrase on pretty much every single episode of SmackDown back then. So, Kurt, wanting a slice of this delicious pie, scheduled a meeting with Vince McMahon. So, Vince sat there and he listened to all of Kurt's ideas about how they could make merchandise for his Olympic gold medal winning 
main character and Vince said, these are great ideas Kurt with just one small problem, we can't do anything with the Olympics because, well, the Olympics own the Olympics and we can't even make an Olympic gold medal because that would be legally problematic as well. So, have you got any other ideas for merchandise for your Olympic gold medal winning character that don't involve either the Olympics or gold medals? And Kurt went, no. If you think about it, everybody and their goddamn dog had a t-shirt back then and all Angle ever really got was, it's true, it's true. Like, he admits himself he should have been more business savvy back then. It just didn't affect him in his later career. But in those opening days, if he just thought a little bit harder, a little bit better about merchandising, he could have made a little bit more, what do we call this these days? Cheddar cheese. Number seven, the real ECW story. Now, a story you might have heard is that while Kurt Angle had knocked back Vince McMahon, he was still open to the idea of giving pro wrestling a go in 96 and thus opened talks with ECW. They invited him down to a show. He was going to join the brand. But having seen a literal crucifixion angle take place in front of his very eyes that night was so appalled that he just cancelled any plans for pro wrestling full stop. Now it turns out this story is true. It's damn true. You see, I got one of those in, but there's more to it than you might have heard. Basically, Shane Douglas, yes, this man broke the ice to Kurt Angle and invited him down to Philadelphia for a completely legitimate wrestling show, convincing Angle that ECW actually ran far more just sports-based, more Olympic-style wrestling than their WWF counterparts. And Kurt did no research. So he went down to the show and realised it was actually, if anything, considerably more ridiculous than WWF at the time, saw some hardcore bloodletting, saw controversial angles, and felt sick to his goddamn stomach and just left without saying goodbye. He literally did the French exit at an ECW show. Hmm. Number six, Kurt thought he would headline WrestleMania 17. On the 12th of October, year 2000, Kurt Angle answered his phone and it was Vince McMahon, about to tell him that in 10 days time, he would be beating The Rock for the WWF Championship at no mercy. He could not believe this. A relative newcomer to the company, he was gonna get to pin the great one and go to WrestleMania as champion. Except Vince hadn't actually mentioned anything about WrestleMania. Kurt just got carried away with himself and assumed he'd be carrying the strap all the way into that show. He started daydreaming about how cool it would be to work with Austin in the main event and what it was going to do for his career. And he probably didn't even know what a transitional champ was back then. He just thought he thought he was it. Sadly, he doesn't go on to the part of the story where Vince tells him that he'd be dropping it at the Royal Rumble because obviously they're going to do Rock versus Austin at WrestleMania 17, but I can imagine it went a little something like this. WrestleMania? What are you talking about, you idiot? You're going to drop the strap at the Royal Rumble. We're going to do the Rock versus Austin, you Olympic idiot. Oh. Number five, Angle lied to WWE about the cowboy hat. Look, if you are perilously short of time today, just go and put this on and skip to 51 minutes and just, just, this happens. Austin, and indeed literally me sat there watching it, could not believe that that was the same cowboy hat from that infamous sketch. He literally asked Angle, is that the same cowboy hat? And Angle goes, it's the exact same one. And it gets better though, because apparently after those skits, WWE officials asked Kurt Angle for the hat so it could be put in storage for a later date. And Angle was like, no, no, I don't, no, I don't think I'm going to give you the hat. I think actually I'll keep it so that I can pop one of my friends on a talk show 20 years down the line. So we just told officials that somebody must have just had off with it. Those pesky interns, those, that developmental talent, Shawn Michaels, who knows, somebody has stolen his hat and he doesn't know where it is. And even better than that isn't just the fact that he lied to the faces of his employers just so he could take a little hat home and keep it for himself. It's that he's managed to hang on to it for 19 flipping years. The guy has not lost that. The guy has not misplaced it when moving house. The guy has not given it to a family friend. The guy has not sold it to try and make a bit of extra cash. He has kept the exact cowboy hat for all this time and my heart grew from this to this when that happened. Number four, his Eddie Guerrero memories are chilling. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's not fun now. 
Now, if you are brand new to this channel, first of all, hello, where you've been? Secondly, I am the only Adam who has ever worked here. Do not Google it. You will know that the Kurt Angle Eddie Guerrero scraps are something of legend and myth in WWE. They're some of the funniest stories you will ever hear. My personal favorite is the one where Eddie Guerrero decides to shoot wrestle Kurt Angle in order to win an argument, at which point Kurt Angle just immediately puts him in a headlock. And then when Eddie Guerrero gets asked, why did you just try an Olympic wrestle, an Olympic wrestler, he goes, Cause I'm stupid. But Angle also recalled that during 2004, he would often see Guerrero looking unwell or deathly pale backstage and only spring into life when he got onto the other side of the curtain. Indeed, in some of the matches, the faster pace segments, he would notice that Eddie was really struggling to keep up with that. He was short of breath. Now at the time, Angle just put all that down to injuries he'd sustained over his career. The guy was in a car wreck in WCW not long prior to this. So he didn't think too much of it at the time. But then of course, when you learn in later life, he had quite serious heart problems. It all it all makes sense. You can see as well, when you watch this back, both he and Austin really struggled to talk about this stuff. Eddie Guerrero was beloved by the men he worked with and his untimely death, I think still really affects a lot of people because it's just such, it's such a senseless waste of life and talent and joy and enthusiasm and all of that. And Eddie Guerrero is somebody who lots of wrestlers still struggle to talk about as you can see here. Number three, Shawn Michaels warned him before WrestleMania 21. Yeah, like I've heard a million stories about how Shawn Michaels is very difficult to work with backstage, but I didn't actually think the angle stuff was something that was gonna come up in all of this. He seemed to have put that politicking, being a bell end phase behind him after this point. But no, apparently in the run up to their absolute classic at WrestleMania 21, there was, Bit of friction. Yeah, basically a few moments before their absolute classic at WrestleMania 21, Michaels pulled Kurt Angle to one side and just completely out of the blue got in his face and said, I just want to let you know, I'm not afraid of you. And Angle presumably just like, sorry, what? Had absolutely no idea what he meant, but this was apparently Michaels telling him that he wasn't afraid to get into a real fight with Kurt Angle if their match went south which is a bit weird really because but why would it it's even more weird this story because apparently in the run-up to this match itself michaels had gone to vince and said he thought kurt angle should be the one who wins the match apparently they weren't totally decided on which way it was going to go it was leaning towards michaels but michaels basically said he should be putting kurt over because kurt was about to go to smackdown into a big feud with batista and should look strong if he's going to do that so he quite happily willingly put the guy over but then just Oh, if this match goes badly, I'll bust you. Number two, how Kurt got Vince's attention before leaving WWE. Right, another slightly uncomfortable bit here. Kurt Angle's departure in 2006 is one of the most speculated upon things in pro wrestling. The guy was just riddled with pain constantly. His bones were breaking, his body was failing, and he was addicted to pain meds. And apparently, WWE let him go because they were genuinely afraid he might die in the ring. One slight bit of brevity in all of this though, Kurt Angle was trying to get a match with Vince McMahon in order to convince him to reduce his schedule, that he needed to slow down, things like that, but he just couldn't get a one-to-one -one meeting with McMahon. So during a show, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, during an episode of Raw, he walked into gorilla position, just little boy wee pulled his pants down and stood there with his balls hanging out completely naked so that everyone backstage could see how bruised his body was. He did this because he wanted a reduced schedule. He still wanted to stay in WWE and Vince was so shocked by this. He gave him his one-to-one -one meeting, but said, no, do you know what? I didn't realize how bad this was. You need to take extended leave. You are, we're taking you off television. We're taking you off the circuit. We're taking you off the house shows. You can't wrestle anymore, not while you're like this. And Kurt went, oh, oh, I didn't mean not wrestle. And then just went to TNA. Number one, he wanted Goldberg's second run. Kurt Angle's weird 2017 to 2019 return is around about the same time and around about the same level of weirdness as Goldberg's return to the company. But objectively speaking, while they were both very strange, one of them was great and the other sucked. But let's just quickly recap all of this. He ended up in the Hall of Fame. He was Raw General Manager. He did that I am the Shield's dad spot at TLC. I think it was. Then he had Jason Jordan as his illegitimate son. That really happened. Then he played second fiddle to Ronda Rousey and then got retired by Baron Corman in a six minute mid card match. That is, well, let's just say nobody planned all that out, did they, at the start? There is no evidence of joined up thinking there at all. 
Whereas again, you look at Goldberg's return, he was in a series of fairly well-connected matches that all appeared to lead to him giving the title to Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. And yes, he has done some random stuff since then, but that's because of the Saudi oil money, isn't it? Not his actual return. And Kurt Angle admitted while talking to Austin that what he really wanted was a Goldberg-like return to the company. Short, impactful main event matches. Short, impactful world championship title reigns. Not whatever the hell that was with Corbin. And something that slightly disappointed me was even though the Ronda Rousey match at WrestleMania was absolutely sensational, he just felt like a spare part in all of that. He was happy to be involved, he was happy to put her over, it was great to work with Triple H again, but it wasn't his match, and he thought if he was coming back to the company, it would be for his matches, which, do you know what? I can't disagree with. And then his retirement, like he admitted that Baron Corbin is a good, talented kid, but that is not how he wanted to go out from the company. <laughs> and my God, Kurt, if you were watching this, my friend, that is not how anybody wanted you to go out of the company. I don't even think that's how Baron Corbin wanted you to go out of the company. So yes, there you go, some more brilliant entertainment for you on this YouTube channel that is somehow free. Let us know what you made of it all in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I could tell you all about the time I had a one-on-one -on -one chat with Kurt Angle, but it was just him leaning against a car, me asking if he wanted a bottle of water, and him going, good times, good times. Anyway, let us know what you made of it in the comments below. I've said that, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I've said that too. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam Cleary. Goodbye to you.